Hello everyone, I'm Kaylee of Nerdy Birdie Adventures and today I'm going to be talking to you about my favourite video game tie-in novels. Now there are lots of different media that tie in with video games, movies, comic books, board games to a certain extent, and obviously novels. Um, as you probably know, video game movies, especially live action ones, don't really have the best reputation. Um, there are a couple of I like, but that, there are a couple that I like, but that's a different video. Um, anyway, if you see me looking down, it's because I wrote out notes to keep my thoughts together. Um, anyway, let's let's get into it. Okay, the first book I'm going to talk about is. Um, Darksiders The Abomination Vault, which this is the novel for, it's the only novel I believe for the Darksiders video game series. I'm a huge fan of Darksiders, I've played all four of the games, the first one's my favourite. don't actually know how many fans of Darksiders are out there, so if you are, let me know. Anyway. Okay, so as I go through these novels, I'm going to try and stick to a certain plan of discussing them, but knowing me, I will just end up rambling, so... But I'll do my best. Uh, Timeline-wise, this book takes place before any of the games, but it ties in most closely with the second game, as they share the primary protagonist of Death. Despite this, it is an unrelated story. Well, kind of, kind of related in, in, in a small way. It doesn't directly affect the events of any of the games, but it's related in the way that um, death is... It explains why death is so hell-bent, pun intended, on rescuing war from the accusations of the Charred Council in the first game. Um, I really like this novel. I've read it multiple times to the point of annoying some people because I would deliberately not read things they'd recommend to me to reread this book. I really like it. It's a good read. Even if you're not particularly a Darksiders fan or you're only vaguely aware of Darksiders, I would recommend this just as a, uh, action fantasy book. It's, you don't need to know a lot about Darksiders to be able to enjoy this. The reason I like this book in particular is it expands the lore of the Darksiders universe and gives us a more in-depth look into the politics between heaven and hell which exist as societies and are you know they're not black and white it's never shown as heaven is good and hell is evil even though they believe that of the other. It also expands on the relationships between the horsemen themselves. There are four horsemen, obviously, four horsemen of the apocalypse. War, death, strife, and fury. Uh, it, you, we don't get a lot of strife and fury, but we still get enough of them to kind of see the dynamic between the four, especially with death being the eldest. To give a brief summary of the actual story of the book, uh, a rogue angel wants to take vengeance on heaven for uh, for a slight he believes that he experienced, he actually did experience, and he uses a really powerful, very dangerous weapon to do so. So the Charred Council sends Death, who has intimate knowledge of this weapon, to basically neutralize the threat as the Chart Council does. This ends up revealing a bunch of Death's secrets and Death's past that he would rather stay buried. And that is Darksiders the Abomination Vault. Okay, next novel is Dishonored the Corroded Man. This is the first in a set of three novels all tied to the Dishonored game series by Bethesda and Arcane Studios. Uh, each of the books follows a different character. This one follows Corvo and Emily. The second book follows Dowd. And the third book follows Billy Lurk. Or Megan Foster, however you prefer to call her. 
Uh, the first one's my favourite. Timeline-wise, it takes place between the first game and the second game. I think it takes place about 10 years after the first game ends, so Emily's about 20 years old and Corvo's an older man. I like the world building in this novel. Um, the first Dishonored game especially takes place exclusively in Dunwall. You don't really get a lot of the Empire outside of Dunwall, so I like how this expands expands that. It expands the Empire of the Isles. You get to see some of Tibia, some of Crystal, um, some of Sirkonos, which you see in the second game, and you get to see more of Dunwall. I also like the way the book book expands upon the magic system that is established in the first game with the Mark of the Outsider. That kind of comes into play with the main antagonist of the book. Storyline-wise, the book follows Corvo. It, Corvo primarily, but also Emily. Um, he, Corvo, is still acting as the royal protector to Emily, but he's also now the royal spy, spy master. So you get to see him in both of those roles, um, acting as the protector and trying to figure out what's happening using his entire network of spies, while also trying to not reveal that he has dark magic from the outsider. Um, together, Corvo and Emily are trying to neutralize a threat to the Empire from a very bitter man using black magic and mirrors, which sounds like it would be cliche as hell, but it's actually pretty cool. I do enjoy all three novels in this series, and I would recommend them if you're a fan of Dishonored. It's just a good way to get extra content. Not related to the novels, there is also a set of docs. Dishonored comics that I would also recommend that I believe are published by IDW. Uh, that leads us into novel number three, which is Final Fantasy XV, Dawn of the Future. This is actually the first of two Final Fantasy novels I'll be talking about. Okay, timeline-wise, this is an alternate timeline starting in the world of Ruin in Final Fantasy XV. So the Ten Years of Darkness, the Days of Darkness, World of Ruin, however you know it. I don't think it's ever given an official name in the game. Uh, the best way I can really sum this book up is that it is a novelized alternate ending based upon story concepts from cancelled DLC. Uh, it does feature a novelized version of Episode Arden, which was released, but it also contains what would have been Episode Aranea, Episode Luna, and Episode Noctis. Episode Noctis primarily being where the alternate ending comes from. My favourite parts of this book, which I'll do my best from this point onwards to try and mention what my favourite parts of these books are without giving away too many spoilers, but my favourite part of this game is Aranea referring to Diamond Weapon as Tiny, which if you've watched the Kingsglaive movie or you've played Final Fantasy VII, you know that Diamond Weapon is not Tiny, it's huge. It takes out the Shinra building. Something I will mention, if you are reading this novel for the chocobros you're gonna be disappointed with the exception of noctis they appear they are mentioned but they're not they're not as important a characters in the book as they are in the game so if you're kind of reading it just for them i would kind of temper your expectations a little bit they're not in it as much as people might assume they would be given how important they are in the game okay next book is from my favourite game series ever, which is Devil May Cry. This is the Devil May Cry prequel novel. Um, its canonicity as a prequel novel is now questionable with the release of Devil May Cry 3, which does really wreck on a lot of the stuff that happens in this book, but it's, as far as the Devil May Cry story goes, it's really enjoyable. I think this is the, I think this is the story they had in mind based upon Devil May Cry's original production as Resident Evil 4. Um, Timeline-wise, obviously takes place before the first game. It, if you put it in the actual game timeline, it takes 
it would, I would say it's supposed to take place between game three and game one, but it takes place before game one. Don't factor game three into it. it. Takes place before Dante opens up the Devil May Cry office when he's living and working as a mercenary under the alias of Tony Redgrave, something that's mentioned in Devil May Cry 5. Uh, he basically starts to experience strange things happening around him with the arrival of another mercenary called Gilva, who is covered in bandages, wears a suit and carries a katana. If that doesn't give away who Gilva is, then I'm not saying anything else. My favourite part of this book is the... The drinking game that happens between Tony and Gilva in the bar, that's kind of hilarious if you read it. Uh, I also really like the origin story of Ebony and Ivory, Dante's twin guns. Something else interesting about this book that took me a long time to realise is that the art in it, art in it is by Shiro Miwa who is one of my favourite manga artists of all time, even if he is a hiatus king rivaling Kentaro Miura, who is the author of Berserk. But his, his art style is amazing and lends itself perfectly to Devil May Cry. So yeah, that's it for the Devil May Cry novel. I could talk about it all day. Um, next up is Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty. This is a direct novelization of the game. It's not a prequel, not a sequel, nothing like that. It's a direct novelization of MGS2. Uh, I have to mention this just because it's Metal Gear Solid 2, but does anybody else remember the uh, Metal Gear Solid 2 skating game that I think was in substance that had uh, that had the, the rock cover of the Metal Gear Solid theme in it? I wish I could find the soundtrack that has that version of that song on it. I would be eternally... I would be so happy. Um, as I said, tells the same story. It's direct novelization. It even includes that infamous codec conversation from the end... from close to the end of Metal Gear Solid 2, which, if you've played Metal, Metal Gear Solid 2, you know exactly which conversation I'm talking about. Um, this novel is definitely interesting in that there's a lot happening in Metal Gear Solid 2 and it's easy to miss some things. It also shows st shows us kind of scenes that you wouldn't get in the game because Raiden or Snake isn't there. Um, it does include the tanker incident, so it goes from the beginning of the tanker incident to the end of Metal Gear Solid 2. Mm, favorite part of this book would probably have to be the codec conversation because it has that scissors part in it. Again, if you've played the game you know what I'm talking about. Reading that reading that in a novel is pretty great. That's it for Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty. Okay. Next book is Bioshock Rapture. Uh, this is a prequel novel to Bioshock 1 and 2. Uh, basically it tells the story of how Andrew Ryan was inspired with the idea of Rapture, how he went about building Rapture, how the society developed, and then eventually how the society fell apart. Um, I get a lot of enjoyment out of the book because of the way it really expands the city of Rapture and makes it feel like it was once a city that was alive, not the remnants of it you see in the game. Um, I also like how it fleshes out a lot of the characters that we only really hear the voices of in the game as well. Um, they feel more like re real people thanks to this book. You get to kind of really see them interact, get to see their relationships, things like that. My favourite part about this book isn't a specific incident, it's how we get to see Andrew Ryan as a person how we get to kind of see his relationships, how those relationships develop, and then in some cases how those relationships fall apart. I especially enjoy his uh, relationship with Fontaine, the way that rivalry develops, the shots they take at each other, all of that kind of stuff. Um, it's fun to see the build-up of that having seen the aftermath of it. You really get a feel for how 
Rapture actually got to be the way it is in Bioshock 1 and 2. The only part of the games that it really doesn't tie into is Minerva's Den, which I don't know if that's on purpose or not. I don't know. But that's it for Bioshock Rapture. Okay. The next one is tech. I'm going to show you one book, but I'm technically including the whole series, and that is the Resident Evil novel series. Um, there are seven books in total. They cover the games uh, Resident Evil 0, Resident Evil 1, Resident Evil 2, Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, and Ro Resident Evil Code Veronica. Um, you may have noticed I only said five games and there are seven books. There are two books, Caliban Cove and Underworld, which tell original stories featuring the characters from uh, the Resident Evil series. For example, Caliban Cove follows Rebecca Chambers and Underworld follows Leon Kennedy and Claire Redfield. As with Metal Gear Solid 2, these are direct novelizations of the game, with the exception of the original stories. I'm kind of sad that these didn't continue with the release of Resident Evil 4, because I'd love to read a Resident Evil 4 novel, if I'm honest. I'd also really like to read a Resident Evil 5 novel, where Chris punches a boulder, because you can't mention Resident Evil and not mention the boulder punching. Also, I think Resident Evil 7 would be a good... Actually, most of the Resident Evil games would be good novels, so I wish this series had continued when Resident Evil 4 was released in 2005. So, I, again, similar to other novels I've talked about, I like these books because they really expand the lore of Resident Evil. You get a real feel through these books of the dickbags that Umbrella really are, and how much they actually have been experimenting on people and animals and trying to get ahead in terms of uh, virological warfare. Uh, favorite book in the series, because I don't have enough time to talk about my favorite parts in each of the books, I'm just going to talk about my favorite book in the series, which is the one I showed, which is called Zero Hour and is the book of Resident Evil Zero. Uh, I like this book mostly because Resident Evil Zero is one of my favorite games in the series and because of Billy, who is an amazing character who disappears into the ether. I don't know where else he's mentioned, if he's mentioned at all. If he is, he's not mentioned a lot, especially considering how popular of a character Rebecca Chambers is and he kind of becomes intrinsically entwined with her. So, it makes me sad that we don't get more of Billy, but maybe someday down the line he'll appear again. Okay, which brings me to the last book I'm going to talk about, which is Final Fantasy VII On the Way to a Smile, which is the second Final Fantasy book I'm going to talk about. Uh, obviously, based on the title, it's Final Fantasy VII. Uh, Timeline-wise, this book's book takes place between the end of Final Fantasy VII and the beginning of Advent Children. Uh, basically follows a bunch of different characters in short like little vignette stories giving you kind of what they were doing during that two year time period between the end of the game and Advent Children. It also sheds light on the geostigma disease, which is a major part of Final Fantasy VII Advent Children. Um, basically, as I said, it follows a bunch of the game characters individually, including Tifa, Barrett, Red Thirteen, Yuffie, and then Shinra, which primarily focuses on Rufus and the Turks. Mostly Rufus. Um, actually, Rufus is the reason that I read this book. I finished playing Final Fantasy VII Remake recently and his glow up in the remake has kind of inspired me to consume as much Final Fantasy VII media as I can, which includes this book. Um, I find it interesting how he comes to contract Geostigma. I think that's just an interesting thing for his character in, in particular. It also includes a lot of backstory for Denzel, who is 
an original character in Advent Children. We get to kind of get, we get a much better feel for the kind of person that he is in this novel because he's a little bit of a blank slate in the film. Like you get some bits and pieces from the complete version of Advent Children, but if you watch, if you only watch the original cut of Advent Children, you don't really get a lot about him. He's just he's a little bit of a blank slate. So it's cool to get a little bit more information on him and a little bit of backstory. Which, if you want to have a heart wrenching moment, you should read this book and read the conversation between him and Reeve. Okay, so. That's kind of it. I def definitely recommend and this book to anyone who wants to kind of get more of the expanded Final Fantasy universe, uh, Final Fantasy VII universe, and is curious about kind of what these characters go through in the time between the game and Advent Children, because you don't get a lot of that in the film. Um, favorite part of the book? Uh, I would have to say my favorite part of the book is... Rufus's escape from the Shinra building after the failure of Sister Ray and the attack of Diamond Weapon. I got a chuckle out of that, not gonna lie. Anyway, that's it for my favorite video game tie-in novels. If you have any video game tie-in novels that you really enjoy, that you'd like to recommend to me, please, please, please send me recommendations. I'm always looking for new stuff to read. Please don't send me The Witcher. I've read those books. I don't count them as video game tie-in novels because the games are based on the novels, whereas with all of these, the novel's based on the game. So, with, don't get me wrong, The Witcher books are great, The Witcher games are great. I don't count them as tie-in novels, though. So just throwing that one out there. Um, I also do have to read the second Final Fantasy VII tie-in novel, uh, The Turk Side Story, The Kids Are Alright. I'm really interested to read that one, given that Rufus is my favourite character. I also like that there are a bunch of characters in that that are up here in the remake. That makes me kind of happy, so looking forward to that one. But anyway, uh, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you hated it, thumb down, thumbs down it. I don't really mind. Uh, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.